Our next guest is a four-time pro bowler and all-pro cornerback during his 11-year NFL career, Antonio Cromartie. Welcome back to Undisputed. Welcome back. Oh, thank you for having me on. Good to have you. <laughs> so you're currently a free agent. Yes. Do you still want to play in the NFL? Of course I want to play. I'm not, I'm not out here training since October, <laughs> last October. So I've been, I've been training for the past year. So I, mean, I feel like I'm in great shape. I'm just ready to go play. Have you heard from any teams lately? I have. I've I actually worked out for a team. I worked out for the Saints back in August. Mm. I had a workout there. It's kind of kind of overweight, but I mean I was 216 pounds. I'm used to play at 210, which I'm at right about now, about 211 right now. So is that still a possibility? It's still New a possibility. Orleans? Still a possibility. Yeah. I would love that. Well, I got to ask the key question: Have you heard from my Dallas Cowboys, who are in desperate need of a veteran <laughs> cornerback? Presence. No, I haven't heard from the Dallas Cowboys no. at all. Really? No, not at all. Do you expect to? Any grapevine word about it? Honestly, no, I don't. I think they I think their biggest decision is they, they want to stay young. I don't think they want to bring in veteran guys. Well they're so young, they're just bad young, right? Now. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta give us you gotta give the young kids an opportunity. I think that's the biggest thing. I think when I first came in in two thousand six with you know Marty Schoenhardt as my coach, he gave me an opportunity. I didn't fare well, but he put me into the office and said, Look, you know, we're going to make you, you're only going to play nickel pack at this. And that's the thing, I, like I say, I always tell people, that's the one thing I respect about Marty Shaw. I mean, he gave me an opportunity to go out and go play. And he didn't like the way I was playing, so he told me as a man, look, hey, you got to play better. We want to play nickel packages, go from there. But, you know, I think Jordan Lewis is doing great. I mean, you, got, you, can't, you can't defend that ball. That's one ball you cannot defend. Well, especially when you're 5'10", and he's 6'2". You know, listen, okay, but you can't say that because Brent Brown is 5'8". Five nine, and he goes he's, out and covers six five. Special man, I mean he. But I think Joe Lewis will be special too. I think I think he'll do his thing. How tall are you? Six one. Six two and a half. Six two and a half. So what was I thinking on Sunday night? If Antonio Cromartie had been my corner over there on that play, I don't I don't think Devontae at six two rises up over you and snatches. Well, that first ball. off, I would have pressed Bell. I'm not gonna press him. I, if I know I'm a I'm a rookie corner. I would have came back. Setting film. That's that's one of the. Devontae Adams' favorite route, the favorite route down the red zone. So I pressed the first time, made a great play. Second he did. time, he made a play. The first second time, I'm gonna show him something different. I'm not gonna give him the same thing. If you notice, but if you notice on the second one, he didn't get his hands on him. The first one, he got his hands he on him, knocked him out, and was able to be yep. there. Second one, he didn't. So it's just, it's just about being consistent. That's all it's about. I mean, he didn't, he wasn't consistent with getting his hands on the receiver, so he wasn't able to defend that ball. The ball was thrown. He jumped late. Devontae Adams already had the ball, so you, you can't defend that. Well, like you said, I mean, you're making jokes about, but I, he never even saw the ball. <laughs> never I, saw it. Yeah. I, I, listen, I've had one of those routes against in 2011 with Tony Romo and Dez Bryant, where I got my hands on him, and before I knew it, the ball was already in his hands, and I'm like, okay, where's the ball? <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you can have perfect coverage, but if they make the perfect throw, there's nothing you there's can nothing do about you can it. Do. I mean, they get it's like baseball. Yo, he's a hot hitter. But if the pitcher throws his pitch where he wants and locates it at the speed he wants, you're not going to hit it. And that's what Aaron Rodgers and those receivers, they practice that so much. Skip, we only practice red I mean, we practice red zone, but they practice so much red zone, exactly. just individual stuff now. Yeah. It's almost like a drill in and of itself. Like teams practice 7-on-7 seven seven and teams practice 9-on-7. Uh, uh, they will practice just these throws. The back shoulder fade, I mean, only a few teams ran it back when I was in the game. That was many years ago. Now everybody's running that because you have to fend it. Okay, how do I fend it? If I stay on top, he's going to back shoulder me. Yeah. If he lags behind, he's going to throw it over the top of me. And still, I got to worry about the slant route. Yeah, so there's so it. much you got to worry about. And like Antonio said, you can't give Aaron Rodgers and his receivers the same look. Because if you, that's why they came back with it, because they knew he was going to press it the exact yeah. same way. And if I get off clean, this is what's going to happen. Yeah, the other you, problem my team has is there's no veteran presence at safety. And there is a guy that you know pretty well still sitting out there on the market named Darrell Revis. Revis Island is on his own island somewhere outside the NFL. I, I can't believe he's not with anybody. Are you surprised? I'm surprised. I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm surprised by myself, too. And yeah, I think we're, well, Revis is 32. I'm 33 years old. Still can play at a very high level. Maybe not as when we're 22, 23 years old, but we, we bring knowledge to the game. Not only knowledge, but you can pass that knowledge on to the younger guys to help those guys understand how to watch film, how to play certain routes, look at formations and study that. I mean, it's just the point, like, us as peers, like, being in that room can be something greater than having a coach in the room. Because players listen to their peers more than they listen to their coaches. 
So if you have another coach that's on the field, and you also have another coach that's in the uh, that's in the locker room to help the guys, mold guys. And if it's a one year thing, it's a one year thing. But now you get those guys that following year to be exceptional players and actually learn the game and know the game about and go play at a very high level. So when you say study film, study formation, were you a were you a formation guy, or you were a uh, uh, formation as far as like three wide trips, or did you pattern read? I did. I did all three. Because <laughs> you got to think when when me and Reeves was together, we had receivers we had to cover. Right. So when we covered a receiver for the week, okay, this receiver lines outside of hash. The only thing he's run, I mean, say outside a yard outside of numbers. The only thing he's run is a dig route, bang gate from this route. If he lines a yard inside of numbers, okay, he's run a curl, he's run a speed yeah. out, and he's run a deep comeback <laughs> on the bootleg. Now, if we're not covering it, now we're playing left and right. We go into formations. Okay, if you run, if you want to run twin pair of slot, okay, we know exactly what you're going to do. Right. You're going to have the down tight end blocking. The other one's going to run a, a crossing route. You're going to have another crossing route coming to us with a deep post coming behind. So it's just little stuff like that, understanding the offenses and knowing where to go. You know where third down is going to be. You're playing against, you playing against, you know, you, you, you break it down to a, a standpoint of understanding who you're going to be or, or where, where the players are going to be. Offenses don't change much. The coordinators don't change. So if they go to another team, if you've got a book on them, you keep that same book because it's not going to change. Tell Skip how you would defend Dez. How defend Dez? I'll take all the inside routes away. I play him inside out because I'll, you're not going to not going to beat me deep. That's the one thing you're not going to beat me. So now you either, you got to run crossing routes. You gonna run. You got to run digs, which is some of his favorite routes. And he, do they run the deep ball? They run the back shoulder fade out in the field. Yes, I want you to run that route because now I'm only going to do it just back shoulder fade and play into it. So. It's just a point of understanding, like, who your player is and what they do best. Yeah, the problem he's, is, though, he hasn't just lost a step. I think he's lost two steps. I, I just I don't, don't see I don't, anything I don't think sudden. so. I, I, think, I think what Dez is doing, he's playing into the system. You can't say a guy lost a step because he doesn't have the same numbers as he had the year before or the year after that. I think what it is is guys are understanding, like, look, okay, we're going to double Dez. If we're going to put our best corner on Dez, sometimes he's going to get a shot, sometimes not. I mean, you got to think, some of the balls that, he's, that was thrown to him, wasn't always great balls. Some of the balls he should have caught, some of them was, wasn't that great. It happens. But I believe as the season goes on, everyone's going to see that theirs is still the same player. I hope but, so. But, but what we're seeing, Crow, is that when he goes up against those other boy dogs, Janoris Jenkins, Harris Jr. to lead, Pat Peterson, we don't see uh, Tremaine Johnson. Mm -hmm. We don't see the Dez that we saw in 2014 when he commanded that big contract. See, when I look at Dez, I look at a guy that's not a technical runner. You don't see Dez run speed outs. No. You see Dez, now he will run the slant if you open up. But if, when I look at him, I don't see him running comebacks on the sideline. I don't see him running speed outs. He don't really run the, he don't run the bang eight. He's an in cut guy. He's a slant guy. He's a back shoulder fade guy in the red zone. He's a big body guy, but he's not technically sound. So it makes him very easy to cover because you're like, I ain't even worried about that. I know you're not running speed eight. I know you're not running comeback mm -hmm. and you can't beat me deep. So back shoulder fade, slant, in cut. Okay, well, now what? Okay, but you got to think, the guys that you name, <clears throat> what did they do best at the line? They pressed. Put hands on. And put hands on. Yeah. I think if you look at the receiving core, even when, I, when we played against when I was in Arizona, if you get your hands on the receiver, it's hard for them to get the timing and what they need on the field. So if I'm a, if I'm a deep coordinator, I'm going to tell my guys to press, stay patient. You know the routes that he's going to run. Right. That's it. Learn the formations. If you learn the formation, you know exactly what this is going to run at a certain spot in a certain amount in time of the game. It doesn't change. It's just the coordinators are not going to change what they do just because you go into another different week. Mm -mm. So the last team you played for was the Indianapolis Colts. Yes. You got cut in just about a year ago in October. Uh, October 4th. October 4th. So we're right on schedule. And your wife then posted on Instagram that she thought it had something to do with the fact that as a team you were ordered not to kneel for the national anthem and that you violated that order and you did kneel and you paid for it. I kneeled twice that, uh, yeah. that year. I kneeled, uh, I didn't kneel the 9-11 the uh, when we played the game on 9-11. I didn't kneel, uh, but I did come in and kneel. I think it was week three and four I did kneel. Uh, but I, like I said, I talked to my wife. I prayed about it. It was something that was near and dear to my heart because I got six, I got six young men, six young boys that's growing up that's black. And at the end of the day, like, we, we got to understand, like, when Colin started it, he sat out. And then when he, he met with a war veteran, and he said, I would rather for you take a knee. Right. 
the same so warrior more, with the guy that he, 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 he. I would rather for you to take a knee than sit down. I think you sitting down is more disrespectful than you taking a knee. Mm -hmm. And I think the message is getting lost in what we're what we kneeling for. Right. The kneeling is for pro police brutality, um, social and, and racial in injustice, and, and it's just like we're losing that because of what the president said. Of what you know, it's like. It, we're getting distracted from the real reason why we're kneeling, right. and we're getting distracted from other things that's going on in the earth, like gun control, Puerto Rico, and everything else. Right. And we're making a big deal about this right here, and about disrespecting the flag. What's disrespectful to a flag is when we come out every day for the national anthem, you're holding it horizontal and flat. That's disrespectful. And you know, to understand that, we have to talk to the guys that's taking the knee. Like I took a knee, and I felt like I was fired because I took a knee. Hmm. They said it was because of my play, but if you look at my stats, I gave up 44.5 yards a game in four games and one touchdown, and that was a one-yard slant to Allen Robinson in the London game, which I took a knee in that game also. Right. So, you know, I just feel that, yeah, I got cut because I took a knee. Do you think that's still operating as to why you don't have a job now? Um, I, I think some of it is. I think some teams are afraid just because one, I'm a veteran guy, I'm a, and I'm an outspoken guy. Right. And I think that may steer them away from a standpoint of saying, okay, we don't want this guy coming in the locker room and maybe deferring our guys to taking a knee. It's not me. I'm not going to tell a guy to take a knee. This, mm -hmm. this is my own judgment. This is something that I have a belief in that I feel strongly about. I mean, I grew up in a single-parent home. I grew in the projects. I, I moved 14 times. I went to 11 different schools, so I understand it. I under, I've seen it. I've seen the academic of guys going into drugs or getting getting killed in front of my face. Right. You know, it's just the point of it depends on how you grew up. And I'm not going to forget where I came from. Back. It doesn't matter how much money I have. It doesn't matter where I'm at. My obligation is still to be a man of my word and be there for my community, and that's the black community. And I think that's what we're – uh, losing the insight on of what's really going on in America and what's what we're fighting for and why we're taking the knee. We've got to take a quick break, but we'll get more with Antonio on the uh, national anthem protest next.